The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Welcome to Gen XYZ. This is a program where we talk about contemporary topics or issues based on the youth. Now, today on the show, we'll be talking about a multi billion dollar industry, and that's the fashion industry, which has been recognized around the globe. And this is also an industry where individuals are being recognized and they put their devotion into showcasing their passion, their creativeness, and also, you can also say that fashion is a lifestyle. So without further ado, on the show today, we have two very special guests to share their experiences with us and also to the youngsters out there who want to join this industry. So let's go have a look who they are. All right, with that, I would like to introduce our two very special guests, Kasun Gunavardhana, who's the owner and designer of the brand Kasun, and also Saji Seniviratna, who is the, the owner and the designer of Mendy Salon. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the show today. I know it's going to be a very busy week for y'all, as the MDFD is also coming up this Friday, and the Mercedes-Benz Fashion Show is next week. And I'm glad that y'all took the time to join me on the show today on this discussion. Right, I mean, y'all have on the, been on this field for so many years and so in your perspective, describe what um, fashion is to you as a person. Saji, would you like to go first? Yes, I'll go first. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for having us. Uh, so, uh, fashion for me. Um, well, for me, uh, I'll keep it short and I'll tell you this because we'll be talking a lot about fashion today. Uh, so for me personally, uh, fashion is a statement. I think it's an individual personal uh, statement. I would say it's a language because if you look at it, it's, it's a form of self-expression and dress as an ensemble. Why I say it's a language now in terms of fashion, yet it's a language for me, but it's been a language dressed as an ensemble since way back during the kingdom times, like tattoos were the identity, tribal tattoos were the identity to say where you're from, who are you, what rankings do you hold, and clothing also, what you wear, what you put on the elements, say where you're from, which kingdom, what ranking do you hold, and it was a form of identity, and now fashion has become your identity to speak your truth and who you are, I think. So do you think that the definition of fashion could depend on person to person? Like obviously both of y'all had different ideas as well. So uh, is it difficult for y'all to market your ideas and your uh, products depending on the definition of fashion with each and every person? Well, um, from the brand point of view, since uh, like you know since I started so this is what I think uh, when I say fashion, fashion is a uh, personal uh, statement so um, always you find like a sort of a group like a customer base that is going to be around your similar kind of style so uh, then like depending on your personal style like what colors you like uh, what kind of silhouettes you like, uh, so then that's, that's a personal style, so that is something that uh, what a person would want to wear. Uh, so that is how that person would make a statement. So depending on that, you kind of find that sort of uh, uh, base, like a community, small community on your own with the brand. So that's how I look at it. Right. Kasan, would you like to agree with that? I would add Saji? to that. Yes, it's challenging and it's a lot of fear because nobody wants to be rejected, your ideas. But um, if you have the right context and you've studied it properly and you've executed it right with the correct research and appropriation as well, I think the right people get attracted to it and you create a community, community. a following, however you want to uh, say it. Tribe a tribe, uh, fan base, and uh, if you have the correct context, I think, you, you end up uh, finding each other. Right, now I would like to talk about your personal brands as well. I think, Kasun, you are going towards a more unisex 
type of fashion and Saji I think you're into the Sri Lankan artisans as well. From where did you both get your inspiration to own this style? Well for me, uh, uh, this of course started back when I was in uh, college, when I was at AOD. So we did our uh, project and we got uh, ourselves exposed to this uh, wonderful uh, Sri Lankan traditional craft. So that's then I saw the potential of craft and how beautiful it is. It's not just for me personally, not just designing clothes, the whole, uh, the process of working with the artisans communities was an experience. So I kind of liked that experience and I wanted to have that in my brand one day. So that's when I started studying a little bit more about it while I was at AOD and then on my final collection I did, uh, I chose the path of being a textile designer so I learned a lot. Yeah, so like that. So the journey started from there. So when I, when I always knew I wanted to uh, explore more and uh, see the potential and uh, not just use craft but uh, use craft and incorporate it in a, in a modern contemporary way so that people can, uh, people, it's easier for people to grasp it rather than just giving a piece of craft. This is contemporary clothing. It's no longer just handloom or batik piece. It's mixed with something, so uh, that's when the inspiration, and then I changed it a little bit over the time. So now I have a unique identity and a DNA for my brand, it's different. So, but always I try and work with artisans. That's kind of like the unique take with Mendesilon. Carson, so what was your inspiration behind your style? It, it runs to since I was born, I would say my mother facilitated this and enabled it so much. Um, I, as far as I could remember since I could talk and walk, she always involved me in all the creative decisions we made when it comes to clothing or building a house or interior. I was given complete creative freedom even at a very young age. And um, I never saw gender as a boundary. I still can't and I never did. And so those elements, I mean back in the day we only had male and female and I did not see anything uh, wrong with mixing those two. And um, when I went to college in um, Singapore 11 years ago um, is when I really saw the fashion industry and the, the pollution, the um, what do you call that, uh, unethical production, Practice. practices, all that really like I, I felt depressed, I was sad to see um, this happening and the fashion industry, such a beautiful creative industry doing this and uh, that was the, you know, the, the bottom of the iceberg and I wanted to find a way to do, still be in fashion and still be eco-friendly because I loved nature growing up, very connected to it and um, then that's when I came to Sri Lanka and I studied at AOD where I was uh, given the opportunity to work with um, crafts and that's when the, the brand started to come up. I wanted to work with um, uh, weavers first. So that was slow fashion, there was no electricity used and uh, it was ethically produced. And um, so I saw a lot of, I was grounded fashion, clothing, all that seemed very grounded and that's where the brand started. But inspiration has run through all my life and I still take ideas from my childhood and experiences and I try to create that with my concepts and my photo shoots as well to try to sell a story. I'm a storyteller, that's what I would say. So would you, you all. Yeah. <laughs> so would you all say that you all wanted to pursue becoming a fashion designer from the very beginning or did you all have uh, different ideas? at the uh, first? Well, uh, for me, well, the first time I knew I wanted to, I had the liking when I watched, uh, when I was really young in my early teens, I was watching uh, Bold and the Beautiful, which was a <laughs> TV series. Like that was like the one of the only few things we yeah, had to watch like English. Beach. Yeah, so yeah, they were running a fashion house. So yeah, I was fascinated with the things like, you know, they were talking about. So uh, yeah, I was try I started uh, imagining myself as a, you know, designer, like it's, it's new, it was new, like this yeah. was a long time ago. <laughs> so it was new, it was new to Sri Lanka for me and my father's background is from garment industry so 
apparel industry. So he was, uh, you know, he was talking about exports, like, but it's not necessarily designing. So for me, uh, yeah, that was close to my heart though, because he was talking about this, you know, working with the foreigners and them coming and visiting the designers and like I've seen those tech packs and fabrics and new clothes. Those were, that's the kind of uh, background that we grew up with. Uh, and then with that, you know, with th 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 things like this on TV, so I was quite fascinated. So I was like, uh, I, then, then, yeah, it built on, like you know, as an industry, I didn't know at that time. It was pretty new, even in 2011 when I joined AOD. It's like as an industry, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. But I had that passion, and I wanted to really become a fashion designer. It was like that little girls need or want or dream. <laughs> so, Kasan, was it the same for I you? I was not a little girl, but uh, <laughs> it was, I, I was interested in architecture, interior design, and I also wanted to become a pilot so badly, I still do. And, uh, but at that time, fashion was the strongest calling, and I think I made one of the right choices. Obviously, the other choices would have been right as well, but this was the strongest calling at that time, and I wasn't an af afraid to take that path. It, it felt really right because every other field and people in it seemed like they were against me for some reason. But uh, this is where I felt like I could be myself and um, grow from there to see how I would, you know, be so able to So was it just like a gut feeling? Or it you was a very knew? strong gut feeling that I always had. And, um, but um, I wouldn't say like, Yes, at that time the general idea was being a fashion designer, but now being a fashion designer also means you're a creative director, art director, curator, all these things you have to be good at. Branding, marketing, oh. it's not just designing clothes anymore. And um, so the, the first calling was be a designer because that's where my strongest calling was, but now it's more like I can jump in through those different, different multidisciplinary. I think you all got into the industry uh, in 2014, if I'm right? We graduated in 2014. I, yeah. we, I, mean, I was 19 when I got in. It was 2019 right. when I started, yeah. Sorry, oh, 2009, not 19. 2009. Okay, so have you seen a change in the fashion industry here in Sri Lanka from 2009 and 2021? A major so shift. But it's not, it's not something that happened over the years also. I think around 2015, 16 is when we started opening boutique stores and uh, being a designer, had a, you had a place to go and sell your clothes, sell your ideas, because before that it was just uh, word of mouth and like fashion weeks to all these events were separated from rest of the society. It was a niche, there was no social media, and the uh, only thing you'll see is on a fashion magazine or a lifestyle magazine. But around 2015-16, social media took over and accessibility um, was easier. Now it's accessible for anybody. And I think that helped for anyone to see and take part in this industry. Right, I see. So Saji, so do you think that the exposure that we get right now is acceptable compared to 2009 and 2021? I think right now, uh, yes. I think yes is the answer because I'm talking from a point of view, from a global point of view as well, not just in Sri Lanka. So currently, the way how the world is, we are one one global uh, village, if you say, like a city or like country, one country, right? We are all connected. So everyone has, a, has access to internet. Everyone has access to, uh, access to social media. And everything is online. And there's so much content that is available out there. So if you are taking it in, it's, it's good for you. But if you are not taking it in, and saying that it's not accessible and then it's a problem, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, there's no limit anymore. Those days, like when we started even, like, uh, like Kasun said, even before we started, when we, when we started in 2000, when I started in 2011, I remember, uh, yeah, it was kind of like the market is opening up. But now, 
it is there like social media through social media like content is there whenever there is a fashion week everything is out there people can go and look at it people can see earlier it was just magazine like before facebook and all of these things it was a magazine and we had to wait for like a magazine to printed media but now it's all digital it's out there people can go online get on on any side and you can subscribe to things email get get the email get it on your email so yeah you have so many possibilities so it's it's out there it's just for you to go and actually you know learn and get that knowledge and get yourself get that exposure uh, locally both locally and internationally and uh, with fashion weeks like mercedes benz fashion week and uh, like you know other events that is happening around it uh, so a lot of these things are going live as well on uh, on uh, our social media as well so people can always get into it have a look at it and it it goes on all these social media platforms so exposure is there it's definitely there it's better <laughs> a lot right. better I than think there's so. a lot of things that uh, i can learn from your definitely our audience <laughs> as well with your experiences but we'll have to go into a short commercial break you're watching genix rise we'll be back soon Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we are in conversation with Saji and Kasun who are renowned fashion designers. So I think in the first segment we spoke about exposure and accessibility into the fashion industry. I would like to get your intake on what were some of the challenges that you faced when you entered this industry or probably starting your business. Okay, so <clears throat> talking about challenges well for me I think uh, yeah getting into a new industry everything is a challenge at the f at first right but uh, the question is yeah it is all a challenge and everything is new so for me uh, but but it is also about uh, answering finding answers to all the questions and solving problems so for me uh, because when I graduated in 2014 uh, from AOD so uh, I joined, uh, joined a small company and then I worked. So uh, it was at that time uh, Island Craft. So there I learned a lot to do like, you know, about business stuff, like not the stuff that I didn't learn when I was at college. Uh, so the more practical things, talking to people, even working with artisans, uh, everything, the whole spectrum of uh, dealing with issues and finding because it was a startup as well at that time. So uh, from there I learned a lot. So that learning helped, helped a lot when I started my own brand. Uh, so the challenges to me, uh, specifically in business was um, initial stage, uh, I made a lot of mistakes uh, when identifying my gap and my market and my customer, things like that were a little confusing. The things that I predicted was, will go right, did not go right. So things like that, it was a bit of a challenge because um, like I said, a little new market for me and identifying customer and actually selling a product on my own. Uh, was a little heavy on me. So I made mistakes, but then from those I learned and then overcame the challenges. So like that, so every day you have a new challenge. Yeah. That's kind of like the way how it is. There right? are no mistakes, <laughs> then there's no growth. You're stuck in the same you know, time course. warp, no? And um, even for me, uh, the creating part was not the challenge. It was, uh, I was redefining menswear, or that's how it was looked at because I was doing it and it was new. And, but for me, it was a natural process. But finding the right customer um, at the time was like, uh, it was difficult when we started. And it, it could be discouraging at times because it's like you have this idea, you have this voice, but no one's hearing it. And exactly. it's a lonely place, but um, with time, as time goes by, it people will catch on if, if your idea is, if your motive is authentic. And um, then comes to when you have a strong identity, because when you come out of college, in any form of creativity, you come up with a strong identity, and then um, you have to compromise here and there 
especially um, financial pressure comes along because you want to make money with what you're making. It can't be too expensive, it can't be too inaccessible. You have to address the audience. So there are places where you need to be more flexible and um, when you're stubborn and you're not able to do that, it, it, it gets the best of you. And, but uh, you need to believe and you need to stay strong and with time it becomes all right. You know, everybody gets on with you and you get on with everybody and uh, you find that balance, but it takes time. When both of you all started showcasing your brands, what were the responses you received? Like, was it expected or unexpected? Were they good comments or bad comments? Were people accepting at first? Do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, so, yes, I did mention that finding customers was hard, but like putting out my ideas out there, it received very positive um, responses. I've never had a single negative um, comment and uh, it also depends on the seriousness of your work as well and um, yeah I, I showcased in multiple platforms and uh, it's you have to you have to stand out actually to be on a platform to begin with and that you have to accept whatever comes your way but I I been I don't know either lucky or maybe my work was accepted but it was been a good uh, feedback yes I think even for me I think maybe the way how we uh, we came out like first maybe the uh, the community and the uh, market and where we are maybe um, so I think I also got positive that there, there is like pluses and minuses but always the feedback has been uh, positive um, towards the collection because uh, when, when we came out, uh, even I think this experience is the same for Kasana, so when we came out as designers, we were accepted because uh, I think the market was ready to accept designer brands like that, like not like uh, how it was 15 years ago uh, where, you know, fashion was like this uh, thing that was, uh, uh, that was something really special and only like privilege can do. But then we were accepted. Now when we came out with the brands and people were buying, supporting and also giving feedback. They were really kind enough to give their honest feedback. So if the fit is not right or if they prefer a certain style to the other and the colors in terms of everything. So uh, so it's, it's the way how we take it. Like I take it as a positive thing because then people actually took time to talk about it and give a positive feedback which then later on helped me in a really big way to grow the brand as a brand. So it's good. The, yeah, they really accepted and yeah, it worked out well. <laughs> yeah, because I think we graduated at the time the industry was waking up yes. and ready. So it was a right time, right place thing. It yeah. matters a lot. Yes. You know, opportunities yes. will flow when you're in the right place and right time. And uh, I think we were right in the, the wake of that. Yeah. So whoever who held on to that opportunity did go far. And then also for me to add a little bit onto this. so. Uh, so I was uh, working at Fashion Market uh, at that time, so Fashion Market .ak. So uh, they had already started and created a little bit of a platform by then. So uh, they had done the little bit of hard work also, like by that time when I came out in 2018. So uh, everybody knew the designer brands and little bit about this, the price points and the effort. They knew like uh, if a designer is calling it a designer brand, then the kind of effort because of through social media and campaigns and like that. So when I came in, I didn't have to start from the scratch because the platform was already kind of created. So it, it was a plus for me. It was good. It was a <laughs> good thing. <laughs> right. So I think the industry already had accepted you all from the start. But how did society accept you all, your family, when you all told them that you all want to become fashion designers at the first? Did they accept it? Because usually Sri Lankan parents, you know, they have this uh, in their heads that okay my daughter should become a doctor or um, architecture or an accountant probably and fashion designing is not really embedded in Sri Lankan parents minds because uh, because of the thing they have that uh, the fashion industry is not successful here in Sri Lanka did you have to face that problem so I think uh, at our time when we left school 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 um, lack of context was the issue, not the parents. 
because the industry had not developed. And just like us, they had not seen half of what we had even seen because um, the, the fashion industry was, like she said, and I uh, said it was limited to a certain section of society and we were spectators and if we were lucky we would be able to spectate. So our parents were working and all parents were working so they didn't have time for it. And uh, being in the industry seemed like a shot in the dark for anybody. It, it, there was no clear plan and there was no steps shown like how you can become a doctor exactly. or a lawyer. There, the steps were very, very, very faded and like um, it was a really yeah. a shot in the dark. And for me, uh, join, wanting to be in fashion, um, there were pressure from school teachers who thought that was not a good idea, who pushed me towards architecture or interior because that's the next best alternative they could come up with. The creative alternative. The creative <laughs> alternative and the fact that I'm a boy at that time, a school boy and becoming a man was also, um, they were trying to put those two things together just because they couldn't. Um, they thought it was a bad idea, but did I really care about what they thought? No, because I had my calling and I have to follow that. Cause How did you overcome that barrier and what's the advice that you can give to someone who wants to follow this passion too? You need to come to that point where enough is enough and at my, in our time, especially me, I had a very hard time in school. I was not allowed to be anything but what school said you can be or society said. And um, that didn't scare me actually. I waited for that opportunity to go against it to be free. And that freedom, freedom of choice, you need to want it, you need to feel it, I think, no? Yes, I Otherwise you'll drown because if you go to listen to every pressure society puts on you, constructs to ideas, it's all attached to your gender, to your religion, um, exactly. and very unnecessary. You can't be a global citizen or you can't go on or get on with globalization if, you are, if your gender, what's in your pants, is going to stop you. Yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, even for me, like, uh, like, like I said before, my father being in, from the apparel industry, so he himself had a problem. Uh, so he was talking uh, like when I said like I want to do this and then the questions were like he he knew like it was it apparel industry in Sri Lanka is a gold mine it's a good place to be and it's like so the only opportunity uh, his concern was what are you going to do like what are you going to do after these three years you know that's the parents point of view right but uh, the only thing he could see was me getting into apparel industry, working in apparel industry, something like that. So, uh, but for me, I knew from day one that is not where I want to be. <laughs> I knew uh, if I'm studying fashion and definitely I want to start my brand. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what my customer was going to be, but uh, it was difficult for them to picture uh, what the future is like because that such, uh, such brands and such a market did not exist sort of like was really niche like where would you go like you know 10 years ago where would you go and buy your clothes from. The only department store was Odell so other than that you didn't have a uh, lot of fashion brands like that. You didn't have uh, designers coming out and saying, I design your clothes. Nobody was there. So it was difficult for, for them to uh, picture it. So I think even now, uh, like we are, that changed for us because we were here, we studied and we did it. But it could be like that for many people out there. People could be still thinking, okay, fine, my uh, child is going to study fashion, but what is the future going to be? But it's also your vision. There is still the opportunity you can go and work in apparel industry. It doesn't necessarily have to be you becoming a designer and having a brand. Uh, there's so many other opportunities around it. And then like I said, social media is there, new things are coming out. You can be anything what you want and fashion can be something. Uh, it's not just learning how to make a garment. You're learning quite a lot of things when you are learning fashion. It could be textile, it could be getting into a... So it's, it's, it's a huge, uh, huge industry. Even publishing, magazines, uh, writing your own blog about fashion, style, things like that. It's not just, it doesn't have to stop at one point. I think that is something that everyone should understand. Exactly, and fashion is a lifestyle, definitely. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, and if you have a vision, I think just follow it. 
a clear vision, follow it. Don't go blind. But if you have a clear vision, just follow it. It will work out. All right. To hold that thought, we'll have to go into a break. I think we should definitely have a coffee over this conversation. <laughs> You're watching Gen XYZ. We'll be back soon. back to Gen XYZ again and we've been discussing about the fashion industry and we've been talking with Saji and Kasun. So I think in the second segment we spoke about accessibility and the acceptance of society in this industry. But when it comes to Sri Lanka, do you think that they are giving prominence of accepting these products and prioritizing the fashion industry or do you think they're providing the adequate platforms to showcase your works? Uh, yeah, so uh, to answer that, actually, um, so talking about the market and uh, market in Sri Lanka uh, specifically, um, I can't really say no because uh, we do have a, a little community, a little community, a group of people that ha that that's gathering around something that is uh, designer, that is uh, when we talk about craft, when we talk about sustainability that also um, I think comes with the uh, education like how much of how much of these things are known to the customer as values uh, so how much of these things are a really adding value to a product that they are purchasing so if you say if I'm purchasing something paying 3000 rupees uh, so uh, the customer should know why I'm paying this extra amount to this particular product so there is a small community that is gathered around it and the exposure is there but also it's not enough <laughs> it definitely is not enough these things um, should not take time especially things like uh, sri lankan design because we are known globally for manufactured in sri lanka made in sri lanka for apparel uh, but i think it's high time that uh, we should get recognition recognized and within sri lanka itself for design in Sri Lanka. I think that's the future and that's where we should be heading towards. Uh, it's currently I don't see that's happening so much. I think with uh, the pandemic uh, we took a little like it's, it's a bit slow process but definitely for me personally as well as a brand this is where I see myself. Next, next big thing I want to do is uh, turn my brand into something that is designed and made in Sri Lanka. So I think uh, little community in Sri Lanka should expand across the island as well as we getting out of uh, Sri Lanka. Kasun, what do you think about the recognition internationally and locally? Do you think the international community accepts our design better than how you all expose here in Sri Lanka? I think if you have an international standard, the identity, there is an infrastructure that makes it um, to an international market, makes it appealing to an international market. And um, uh, the, the challenge here is the platforms are there. We have Colombo Fashion Week, we have Mercedes Fashion Week, and we have the colleges, and we have all the resources and the, the factories and the people, all that is there. But it's, it's a matter of whether the designer is uh, ready to explore because uh, some of the, 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 the production process, the, the machines, they might be just in factories for the garment fac um, uh, industry, but when you are a designer and you want to do something, it be the process becomes slower because you need to find certain machines, certain people with the, the technology, the skills, and uh, I think that's what uh, sets you back the most because uh, the cost becomes a problem. So either you uh, take your time and you need to have a second income I think in the creative world you have to have a, um, a second income because with your um, creativity itself it's difficult at the start and that's a reality and that's something that uh, by default it's the nature of that industry. Till you make your name you're going to struggle. So till then who's going to pay your bills? Well, are you going to pay it? You know? Practical problems. Yeah, practical <laughs> problems. And uh, But if you keep that aside to access the international market if you have if you have the capability to build a network which is the most important 
you can be creative or not so creative. If you have the right network, you can make it. That's, that's, that's um, I don't know if it's a sad reality, but that's reality. And, uh, and networking, interpersonal skills, social skills, those are very, very important and that can take you very far. And yes, international market is not something uh, impossible. It's right there if you want to take that step. But it's like the industry know-how is there. So how do we incorporate industry know-how, apparel industry know-how and everything else and take that as an in advantage to uh, like, yeah, mix the design elements into this. You should be able to identify resources and work with it. And it doesn't matter how uh, uh, what made you get to that point, what you do with it. The final outcome. Yeah what you do with it like you could you could say that okay this person has contacts or this one comes from a garment factory background or your father owns a factory something like that would push you a little more forward for sure but use that to get to where you want to and it's fine I think right so now being designers I think you all also demand for designer clothes are very high here in Colombo but then do you all have a strategy in mind to expand that purview into other areas as well. Do you think it will be even effective by doing so? Um, when you're saying other areas, you mean other... Outside Colombo? Outside Colombo. Well, it depends on the, tourist, uh, the tourism, the tourist industry, because wherever the tourists are, where it becomes a hub, it becomes a commercial city eventually, right? The restaurants, the music, the events, all get exported to those areas. And... Um, those communities also start developing around those areas and um, so you need to be in track with that but because of the pandemic we had strategies we were working towards so many uh, platforms that were gonna pop up in other areas of the country but the pandemic really hindered that growth so if we avoid the pandemic or like we don't talk about it as if it doesn't exist then um, yes you can be strategic and, and build it and it was getting there. All right. And now coming back to again designing. When a person wants to get into designing, do you think that individuals should have a very unique style for themselves or something new that they should introduce into the market? Because I've seen a lot of de designers, they call themselves designers, but it's almost duplicates of something else. So do you think in order to be successful, a designer should have a unique style? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think uh, not just in fashion design uh, but any creative industry I think uh, being unique is like the number one key thing having your own identity I think um, for me I personally tell this to everybody like you know even if it is uh, not you being in creative industry even as an individual you have you be authentic to yourself you have your own personal style we call it personal style so I think when you are when you are in the uh, like on the other side, not in the uh, consumer, when you're not the consumer, when you're designing for a market, it's crucial and it's a must. You have to be unique. You can always look at other people's work, be inspired, all of this, but you should never really copy anybody. I think it's another big problem that we are facing as designers. Um, like when not specifically my brand, but the designers uh, are facing this like it's, it's a really sad situation uh, everybody's copying everybody's work here and especially if you look at Sri Lanka as a sm very small market Sri Lanka itself as a country is very small market and then uh, we have saturated that into Colombo like even a tinier market and in this if uh, people are coming calling themselves designers retailers it's nice I think uh, we should we need a lot of designers more designers it's good but with their own unique story, not to copy or take uh, pieces from other p people's work. It has to be unique and authentic to themselves. I think it's very important. But then again, when you're talking about uniqueness, like trends and fashion, it's, it's changing with time, right? So is it important to adapt your styles accordingly or just straight to, to your design? So I would add to what she said. Um, all what you said is 100% if you want to go down that individual individualism, that path. And But I think individualism has also created a lot of depression and suffering. If that becomes your struggle, 
when you're not uh, able to look outside that also because you have to have that openness and I don't think there's anything wrong with someone creating fast fashion taking a trend and making it normality because we need that we need our message is not always going to be strong enough to spread throughout because if we are unique then only unique people will be attracted to you and you'll always be separated from the rest of society and uh, that is important to create more inspiration uh, and which will eventually get saturated into other designs that's the it trickles down that's the word term and uh, but you do need those other people who are running the fast fashion industry in the mass market because they are the ones who um, help people who can't think that individualistically or like um, uniquely to accept uh, fashion. You have to give something that people understand as well, right? So I think both need to exist to support each other. One can't survive without the other. I think since you mentioned fast fashion, mm -hmm. fast fashion I believe is contributing a massive percentage to pollution. What can you say about that? The second largest contributor to pollution exactly. is fashion. So would and you say the slow moving fashion is also contributing to the same amount or wh what are your thoughts on that? So I think um, humans evolved and we got it wrong somewhere where we can't um, supply to the demand with the traditional methods. That's why the machine came along. But now the machine is overproducing because we are overpopulated and we are overconsuming. But it's too late to go back. We can't stop everything and start going to back to the loom completely. It's a completely different industry. These two can't compete with each other. One, both has to go on. And the fast fashion, we can't predict what's going to happen to it. But all we can do is make consumers more conscious and aware. And that is tied down to crafts, heritage, culture, geographically reasons. All these things come into play. What resources do you have? What technologies do you have? So if you make use of those things, you, you can give a, a better uh, message, make people more conscious. But it's, it's hard to survive without the fast fashion right now. It's about a balance. So as long as you understand that, you will know how to use both of those services. Right, now talking about sustainability, now your designs, do you all have a plan to sustain this style for the next few years or so? Or what are the characteristics you say are the strong points that you all stand out in the market? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, like the previous question, like again, like fast fashion and slow fashion and sustainable, like all these things are in topic right now. So for me, what I, I'm trying to do, especially um, after the pandemic and then we had to pause and then the brands has to pause and then I redirected and I read a lot about these things. Uh, so um, my take on this is, um, so I'm planning to uh, expand out as well as an exporting brand. So um, for me, the important thing is uh, educating the consumer. So with my brand, what I'm trying to do is educate my customer how to be conscious with what they are purchasing. So uh, this, is, this is my uh, unique uh, take on uh, Mendicillon. Mendicillon is now educating the customer. We are not uh, producing five, six collections a year. We, are, uh, we have taken down to maximum three collections a year. So the plan is to uh, design rather than going and uh, doing uh, six collections per year. Uh, focus more on the quality and then uh, even with a little higher price point, uh, educating the customer to consciously wear things that can last a longer time. So that's why when it comes to trends, I really, with my brand Medicilon, I really don't follow trends. I do look at them, I do look at uh, things to educate myself, to be on top of the list, to know what is happening globally. But uh, I don't really uh, follow trends and I don't do whatever is one celebrity wearing or what is in the fashion weeks outside Sri Lanka. That is not how I want to take the approach. I want my customer to have something timeless. So it's not something that you would wear today and next season not wear it. I want something, I want to give something to my customer that they can wear and pass it down a generation. Something that is quality. Uh, so, uh, so that is kind of like my strategy, educating the customer. And uh, if my customer is aware of the things that they are buying, so my uh, collections that I have uh, done since uh, 
since COVID last last year, 2020. So I always try and think uh, if I have a certain silhouette, like what is the styling piece that would go with it for the next season? Because how much of it a person can actually wear? Already Colombo is a saturated small market. So especially in this, even going outside, this is the message that I want to take outside to the world from Sri Lanka as a Sri Lankan brand. Conscious wardrobe. Okay, I think we are actually running out of time as well. Kasun, would you also say the same or do you have a different uh, strategy? I, I, I would say that I don't think anyone, um, change is the only permanent thing and you, when you grow organically, the transition is smoother. So you can't stick to the same style. You have to grow and you have to grow with the world around you climate change, so everything affects you. And as a designer, it doesn't mean that you're forever going to be in one city, right? You want to be able to move around the world and you want other people to see your clothes as wearable. So you have to change, you have to grow, but it has to be organic. Okay, so finally, I would like to ask both of y'all, if there's a youngster out there who wants to pursue their career in fashion designing as well, is there anything or advice that you would like to give them or the pathway they can follow? What can you tell? Yeah, so I would just say if anybody, whoever wants to follow their passion, if they are really passionate about being a designer, studying fashion, I don't think they should stop for any reason. I think they should go ahead and do it. I think um, it's, a, it's a good industry to get into. It's uh, fashion as an industry is good, but be open-minded. I don't uh, advise anyone to get into the industry thinking that you are going to find all the answers on the first day. You will, it's a, it's a journey and you need to, you should be resilient and then you should, you should learn to adapt and change as you go on. You don't need to like get into it with a fixed mindset and say like this is what I'm going to do and stick to it. But you know all along the way like if you feel like you want to you know write editorials, you want to go and write about fashion, why not? Just fashion design is not just one thing, it's a lifestyle, it's many things. So uh, yeah, that would be my message to Kasim, have an open mind. Do you mind. also think that Sri Lanka has the available platforms for anyone to pursue Absolutely. their career here? If you think it's not that you create it, that's what creativity <laughs> is. And it's a multidisciplinary industry, like she said. You don't just become a designer, you're a graphic designer, you're a marketing manager, you're, you're in branding, curating, art directing. So many paths you can go down so on. It, 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 it's, it's a fun place if you look at it positively and uh, there's so much you can do but it's all in the hands of the person who's aspiring to be that. So like she said, be open and you can create your own future. It's, it's as simple as that, I think. Well, I believe that our audience who's watching this and the youngsters out there who want to join this field would have gotten something out of this program and again, thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the show. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. Having us. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And that's all we have on the show today. Gen XYZ will be back again next week with another topic that is based on the youth. If you couldn't watch this program on air, you can always catch us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Stay safe and have a good night.